Welcome to the Jordan Show. Right now, it is 10 a.m. in Los Angeles here, but this time in China, it's 1 a.m. But today, my show has invited a very special guest, Dr. Mark Abdani. Dr. Abdani is a worldwide political economist and a scholar. He has served as professor. And School of Politics and Economics at Claremont Grad University since the year 2000. He is also very active as a professional and worldwide business consultant, managing companies in both the U.S. and China in the past. Currently, he is a Chief Operating Officer and serves on the board of the director. And Centiar Group in the Washington D.C. He creates innovative software and services for strategy and management through the advanced analytics for data-driven decision making. He has many business operation, client products, services, and technology in the nation across areas such as corporate strategy, finance. M and A, public and private partnerships, negotiations, and technology solutions. Also, Dr. Mark has many publications and speaks with global leaders on the twenty-first century challenges facing executive and governments alike. His new book called. The performance of nations is due to be published in the September of this year. Dr. Ma, welcome to Jordan. Thank you, Jordan. When I really read your biograph, I found the word innovation appeared a few times.、Mm. As an economist, what does the word innovation mean to you? Excellent, Shi Shi Zhuzheng. Thank you so much for giving me the honor to be here today.、Uh, my pleasure. You're welcome. <laughs> when we when we think about innovation, there's basically two types of innovation that we, that we see in the world. One is what we call in U.S. business. It's better, faster, and cheaper. It's how can we make a better cell phone? How can we talk to more people? How can we communicate more effectively? Um, how can we have bigger mega ships to transport goods and、uh, across the ocean? So you think about those type of innovations, and those innovations allow us to create more revenues, to create more products, to do more trade, right? So they grow our top line revenues in terms of the money we take home in our pockets、uh, in, in a business, but they also expand the bottom line in terms of the profit that we make in a, in a company. Right, so in terms of the cost of the business, right, but we can keep more of that in terms of our margins. So that's the first type of innovation, and you can think of、uh, millions of innovations like that every day. We as individuals innovate because we're better human beings. We do better at our jobs. We're happier. We interact with more people. So that creates more relationships and, and more value.、Um, but there's a second type of innovation. And、this innovation is very, very important.、Um, some people call this disruptive technologies in Silicon Valley or Shenzhen,、mm -hmm. right? And other people call them inventions. But、uh, this type of innovation is when you create a new market, a new idea, a new product, or a new service that never existed before. So, I'll give you an example of, of something recent that, that we're all aware of: Apple iPad, for example,、mm -hmm. is a Brand new innovation that created a tablet market. Now everyone's running around. You, you see, you walking around、uh, either in、uh, the grocery store or shopping. People are on their iPad, and、uh, so that creates a brand new market space.、Um, we call these things blue ocean strategies. And so, what do we mean by blue ocean? So、um, we can think about、uh, competitors in the ocean as sharks. Business people are. Are sharks right? So we all can identify with that.、Um, so these sharks go swimming around, trying to eat the fish. And so as they eat the fish, grab the fish. What happens? There's blood in the water. 
Zhengzhu, what happens when there's blood in the water and, and sharks are around? Do more or less sharks come? More sharks. Why? Because they know that there's business, there's a transaction, there, there's something that can happen. So you start to see big companies moving in mm -hmm. and competing. And they're competing, they're biting more fish, they're making more money, and more and more blood gets spilled in the water. These type of market conditions are what we call a hyper-competitive market, or a red ocean. So you have many people coming in, you could have uh, large companies, Baidu, Alibaba, Google, <laughs> IBM, et cetera, they come in and are competing for market share. Well, the second type of innovation, this real invention, goes much further beyond that because it takes us from this red ocean to a blue ocean where there's new markets, there's no competition. So you think about the innovative ideas. Mao Zedong and George Washington were idea innovators in our respective countries. Mm -hmm. uh, you think about, though, in, uh, in business, Alibaba is a wonderful innovator in China because they created an entire new market which did not exist there before. So the challenge is always looking at innovation from uh, economics or a business perspective is to understand, are you going to do evolutionary innovation or revolutionary innovation to create these blue ocean and market strategies? On July 6th, this year, Chinese President Hu Jintao uh, delivered a speech at the National Scientific Innovation Conference in Beijing and said, we must focus on promoting innovation in science and technology if we want to push forward reform and opening up policy. And the, the moderation of the social needs and achieve the overall target for building the moderated, prosperous society in an all round the way. Improve the people's living standard as well as achieve the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. President Hu also urged authority and all levels to expand investment in science and technology so that spending research and development of the whole society will account for more than 2.5 percentage of the GDP in 2020. Dr. Ma, what would more innovation in science and technology mean for a nation? What would it really mean for China? Excellent question, Zhengzhou, because this is, a, is what is at heart for the challenges of the 21st century. Uh, we think about the 21st century now, but I'm reminded of the 11th century with Li Tiang, the Chinese monk who's credited with discovering fireworks. And so we think about that was, as we were discussing before, a blue ocean strategy. It's a brand new invention. That invention created a new market. It created people celebrating around the world through the Chinese invention. Today, we still celebrate the 4th of July as Americans, thanks to Li Tian's invention. But his invention also led to gunpowder and weapons and arms. And so in a lot of ways, that shaped the course of history over the last thousand years. So there's one specific example of how technology, a simple technology at the time, can have a very large impact. So we think about President Hu Jintao or Barack Obama or any technology investment that we make as a company, what does that do? So technology is like a multiplier. It says that, okay, so if I'm doing this well, mm -hmm. right, if I weigh 20 kilo, or if I weigh 100 kilos, mm -hmm. technology can make me much bigger. So maybe multiply it by two. So we look at new technologies that come in, our cell phones, for example. So the cell phone allows us to communicate. It allows me to talk with colleagues. It allows me to talk with my family. It allows me to work more in less time. So that's a multiplier. Think about uh, if we want to go for lunch and we're in a new place. Uh, I'm in Beijing and uh, I can't reach my friends on the phone. I can search on the phone. Where's, my f where's the closest favorite restaurant? Where's South Beach, for example, um, and find that. So we can go there and 
we'll go have lunch, we'll spend money, we'll be happy, we might do business, so we've just created more economic value. So those are very simple examples of, of technology to be a multiplier. Um, how can technology, though, be a really big multiplier? Mm -hmm. And, and this, is, this is important for the United States, for China, for developed and, and developing countries. Uh, this past week, I was talking with a physicist uh, colleague of mine, and we were talking about technology and the role of technology in the economy or in politics and society. And he said, amongst all his physicist friends, that everyone believes within the next 50 years, we will have something called cold fusion technology or free energy same sort of technology that was developed for weapons, for atomic bombs and nuclear weapons, we can civilianize and use water in, to propel energy. And that's basically free. Think about that economic impact. Think about the multiplier that that has. So, if energy is free, you and I can go back and forth between Beijing and Beverly Hills as much as we want. We can have coffee, we can have dinners, we can do business meetings, we can have diplomatic uh, summits, we can exchange goods and information freely. What kind of world does that provide us? What kind of opportunities does that provide China as a country? You had uh, migration patterns from the West uh, into the South in China in the Great Industrial Revolution that you, you guys have experienced since the uh, 1978 uh, Great Opening by uh, Deng Xiaoping. Now you can mobilize people in second, third tier cities very easily. And now you don't need these big migration patterns. So it really creates a brand new world, a brand new frontier. And so we see the implications of technology here in America. And from a business perspective, we've moved from uh, what we call bricks and mortar, that I need to have an office. And in my office, I need to have all the employees. And all the employees have to live close by. And that's how cities actually build, because you, you build a locus, you build a center for people to pr uh, produce some sort of economic activity. But the cities get crowded. And here in Los Angeles, we have terrible smog right, because of all the cars, et cetera. Well, now we can live anywhere and we can virtually interact and telecommute. So um, this gets back to when we were talking about innovation um, and productivity. Um, technology can be a huge multiplier. And all countries are developing technology, some faster than others, et cetera. And this is what really propels global economics. And, and so that's what's exciting, uh, to see the future and what's going to happen. President Hu Jintao proposed six suggestions for accelerating the constructing of the country of the innovation, including promoting innovation-driven development, improving self-innovation capacity and system, optimizing environment for innovation, and expand international cooperation. So, Dr. Mark. My understanding is improving innovation is to our country means competition. How can we integrate innovation improved and competition into expand international cooperation like the Mr. Hu, uh, like the President Hu said? Excellent question, Zhang Let me ask you, let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. What sports did you play as a child growing up? Of course, ping pong, you know, Chinese people always uh, play ping pong. Excellent, excellent. And ping pong, did you play singles or doubles? Were oh, individual or, double. or doubles? <laughs> excellent, excellent. Double and single, both. Okay, <laughs> but wonderful. Some, so you're very pong, good, yeah. I see. Huh? <laughs> okay. So when you think about innovation, it's the same thing as playing a sport. And so as a child, were you very good? How old were you when you started playing ping pong? I think probably... Uh, I'm a good player of the ping pong, so probably nine or eight nine. or something like that. Excellent, excellent. And so as you played, you became better and better, right? So the more you practice, you become better. So in a lot of ways, that's innovation, right? But it is not, it's not the invention, but innovation of becoming, a, having a better forehand, a better backhand, better positioning. Um, so you learn to innovate to win the game to do more with less effort. 
so that you can beat your opponents mm -hmm. and become a really good ping pong player, mm -hmm. right? So you innovate in the framework of competition, mm -hmm. right? Well, where does cooperation come into that? So, don't you have to play doubles? Didn't you yeah. play doubles? Yeah. So if you played ping pong like you did in singles with your doubles partner, would you be a good team? Mm -hmm. No. Why? Because you have to know, you have to understand, oh, this is my shot, my, my backhand is strong, my backhand is weak, and you fit together as a team, right, to compete, to do things well together. So why I don't think innovation, competition, and cooperation, especially in the, in the U.S.-China uh, context, is all mutually exclusive is because we are playing the same game, we can play doubles, as a team, and we can win together. That's the fundamental purpose. And so uh, um, I think about a, a few years ago, uh, a friend of mine in Beijing had a brilliant striking comment. He said in 2008, the Beijing Olympics introduced China, inter introduced, the citizens of, uh, uh, introduced the citizens of the world to China. Yeah. In 2010, the Shanghai Expo introduced the world to the citizens of China. Mm -hmm. So you think about how we can compete together, right, in terms of business, in terms of markets, but how we cooperate. Let's play doubles together. Because you have, you have a good backhand, I have a good forehand, you have very good uh, manufacturing facilities, I might have very good R&D, and we can win in a much better game together. So this gets back to when we have the Olympics coming up, right? Um, let's say the U.S. basketball team, uh, gold medalists, for some reason they don't make it to the medal rounds. Well, then and the Chinese do with Yao Ming. Yeah. I'm going to cheer for Yao Ming. <laughs> Why? Because we want to see the best. Whether it's Chinese, American, English, French, Japanese, Korean, it doesn't matter. At, at that level, at the, at the global level, we're all cheering for the best. And that's how we can get together. That's how we can overcome perceived competition with adding innovation to actually get in international cooperation, which a lot of economists call shared prosperity. Let us go back to March 7, 2012. Hillary Clinton uh, made a speech remembering the Lexan trip and the U.S.-China relations today and the U.S. USC, U.S.-China Institute, she said, so we are committed to this partnership and now we and others around the world are looking for even greater leadership from China. China and the United States cannot solve all the problems of the world together. But without China and the United States, I doubt that any global problems can be solved. We want China to be the full stakeholders and embracing its role as a major global player to help in strengthen the international system that makes its own and our success possible. All the while, we will continue to seek every opportunity for engagement with China, but not just at the government to the government level. We will keep discussing our differences openly, developing as many avenues for cooperation as we possibly can. In short, we will continue the journey begun by many in this room 40 years ago. According to the Secretary of the State of the United States, Hillary Clinton speech, Dr. Mark, if we should wait for another 40 years or 20 years, will we hear another top leader from the U.S. speak similar words? as a Hillary Clinton this bitch, why? Oh, <laughs> I hope not, because uh, I think that uh, we're going to see a lot more of this. Uh, 
we're going to see this. We're not going to have to wait 40 years. We're not going to have to wait 20 years. We might wait four months, four weeks, or four minutes. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is because looking back uh, over the last 30 years in China's amazing economic growth, looking back over the last 30 years in the United States economic growth, the uh, European economic growth, everyone is beginning to realize Secretary Clinton's words, Hu Jintao, uh, President o Obama's words, about the role or the, the leadership responsibility in the global international community. So this gets back to there's going to be more interactions, more high-level diplomatic exchange visits, uh, more people talking. Uh, the CEO of uh, GM is going to be visiting the Shanghai Automotive uh, Investment mm -hmm. uh, in Industry Corporation more and more because there are these shared prosperities. There is this economic interdependence. So um, one of the things that I, I personally uh, believe is that we need to have a new dialogue. And Secretary Clinton is, is exactly right in terms of what's the dialogue so that we could vet our differences. Because uh, obviously th there's sometimes different economic interests, different business interests, different geopolitical interests. But that's always been the case throughout the course of human history. That's, that goes everywhere. Um, Tip O'Neill, a, a wonderful American, very, very famous congressman, politician, uh, has a wonderful quote. He said, all politics are local. And politics, what does he mean? That the politics in a, in a school board, the politics in a company, the, uh, the politics in a nation is driven by the people. So that gives me hope because we're all subject to the same forces and we can understand those forces and we can overcome those forces because we can work together at the international level. So this gets to what are some of the really tough challenges we have to face as Americans, as Chinese, globally. Um, since the 2008 global financial crisis, of course, the U.S. markets have been down, GDP growth has been down from 2.5% revised continuously to 1.6, 1.7%. Um, unemployment up at levels that we haven't seen in this country since 1991, 92. And there's not a lot of economic optimism. So in that environment, it's very easy for people who lose their jobs, and I would be one of them doing the exact same thing if, if it happened to me, of Blaming outsourcing, blaming foreign countries or foreign companies for taking our jobs. Um, there are many people out there that uh, blame the Chinese for buying up U.S. Treasury and saying that uh, they're coming in, buying real estate, et cetera, and Americans aren't doing that. That's one way of looking at it. But I don't think that's a constructive way of looking at it. I, I think that's a more of a destructive way of looking at it because by creating this economic interdependence. Chinese government are buying U.S. treasuries, we're buying goods, there's the exchange of technology as well as capital. What are we doing? We're creating a new blue ocean. We're creating new markets. We're creating much more value that we can capture together in a shared prosperity manner than we could ever do before individually. So, that's what's exciting. And like any relationship, whether husband, wife, friendship, right, uh, business colleagues, you have to manage that. And it's the exact same thing, whether individual or at the, or at the international level. So we're going to see a lot of this. And the more we see, the better I'm going to feel because relationships are not about compromise necessarily. It's, it's about conflict management. And it's about how we can agree where to go to lunch, when to go to lunch, and some days we go to the places I like to go, some days we'll go to the places you like to go. But at, at the end of the day, we still have a good meal, we still have a good friendship, and we can do great things together. And, and so that's the whole idea of this shared prosperity. Dr. Ma, as a worldwide economist, how long do you think China and the United States will be stakeholders as global players, why? In 2000, I wrote a book called Power Transition. 
that said um, China would surpass the U.S. economy or at least uh, reach parity with it by about 2025. Uh, that was revolutionary. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have to remember the environment then uh, was the dot-com era, Silicon Valley generating mm -hmm. a, lo a lot of value in the economy. And China really hadn't accelerated its growth, even though it was doing wonderful, but no one was paying attention to it. Um, and then subsequently, a few years later, 2003, 2004, Goldman Sachs, uh, Lehman Brothers came out with their reports of the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, and, and how they're going to grow. And so now everyone knows, right? It, it's no secret, it's no surprise. Um, the 20th century was the American century. The 21st century will be the Chinese century. Thank you. <laughs> Why is that? Because they will be global players because of sheer economics. When you think about how big an economy is and, and how well an economy does, it's based upon two things, three things. And we talked about innovation and science and technology as a multiplier. But what's the fundamental unit that they're multiplying against? Well, uh, two things. One is labor. So you can think about labor as number of population, number of people in a nation. So in China, we have 1.3 billion people. In the United States, we have about 300 million. So in terms of just people, China is four and a half times, is four and a third times larger than the United States. Now, you look in terms of money, in terms of physical capital or investment or uh, uh, income capital in the market, the U.S. is bigger than China. So we take our income capital, right, with our 300 million people, and we go out and we produce what we call GDP. China, on the other hand, has 1.3 billion people. They take their physical and income capital. They go out and they produce something called their GDP. But what's interesting is for the United States to stay the same or ahead of China, we are four and a half times smaller in terms of population. That means that every individual American worker has to be four and a half times more productive than the average Chinese worker. Now, Having led management teams, both here in the States, international management teams, and, and management teams in China, that's not possible. Because Chinese workers are the same as American workers. They're smart, they work hard, fast, and efficient. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, this gets back to, at the end of the day, everyone, people are the same around the world. Mm -hmm. And we make that you know, folksy comment, that anecdote, but that's what helps drive economic theory because I can use the same theories that are driving the American economy to look at how they drive the Chinese economy. So um, the Chinese between 2020, 2030, uh, given the best World Bank and, and different economists' estimates, saying that they'll uh, surpass the, the U.S. economy. Um, not that the U.S. economy is going to disappear, not that the Chinese economy is going to disappear, but th that's the trend line. And growth might spike due to a real estate bubble here in the States or uh, difficulties in financial markets, et cetera. Um, but that doesn't stop the trend. Uh, so who else is going to grow? What are the other players on the global stage? So we first want to think about what are other countries with large populations? Because of the resource, the labor pools that they can mobilize. India instantly comes to mind. Um, so a lot of people estimate that uh, China will reach the uh, premier economic position in the international environment by 2025. My estimates, plus or minus a few years, India might get there by 2050 or 2060. So what does that mean for economics? What does that mean for cooperation? What does that mean for competition? So we know the eventualities of what's going to happen, right? But we need to think back in terms of what do I do differently today? Knowing that in 10, 15 years from now, mm -hmm. right, we're going to be equal partners. So I could look at the world from a competitive perspective or knowing that we're gonna be married in 15 years from now, <laughs> Joe, that we can be great friends and great partners. So fundamentally, 
the same dynamics that have propelled the French, the British, the Germans, the Americans, the Japanese to preeminence in the international economic environment is propelling the Chinese. The same dynamics will propel the Indians, maybe the Russians. They're propelling the Brazilians. So we have to understand this. We have to recognize this as individuals, as consumers, as executives, as, as leaders, and see that the global stage is going to be set. And there's going to be new players coming on the stage. Um, these new players are going to have different economic interests, different perspectives. But if we look at it from an international cooperation or a shared prosperity perspective, there's so much value we can create together. And that's what's key. And that's what separates us from doing good things to doing great things. You are Connecticut professor of the Claremont Credit University. I know you are also lecturing in quantitative methods for MBA, MA, and PhD program across business strategy, econometrics, computational uh, modeling, data analytics, social network analysis, and system and dynamics. And in the past, you have provided emerging market economic financial and political risk advice so senior executive in energy, finance, and technology and services. Dr. Mark, you are involved in so many areas. So uh, you are a professor, you are a writer, and you operate a management consulting firm. You give lecture and a writer. And in, may I ask you a personal question? Yes, sir. How have you managed to accomplish so many things? in your life, and how do you juggle all the responsibilities? So unfortunately, when you juggle too many things, you end up not doing one thing well. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I don't look at myself as particularly successful based upon past accomplishments. Uh, I look at myself and how happy I am given what I'm doing currently and what sort of future, what sort of opportunities that I create or, or create together. Um, so the trick is, whether in, in business, in, in politics, in economics, as, as individuals or as executives, it's to be able to focus and prioritize when you need to prioritize on a specific task. Um, and, and this gets to, this is where the economics and, and the management matters. So. As kids, we're in school, whether Chinese or American, we're supposed to be the best in math, we're supposed to be the best in science, we're supposed to be the best in arts, the, the best in music, the best in physics, etc. Um, and we're given grades, we're rewarded, we're conditioned to get A's or 4.0 or whatever it is, right? Um, well, I'm not the best in everything, I, I know that. Um, and there, there are a few people that are very lucky that are. But we come together and we work as a team, and this is the whole thing of shared prosperity and cooperation, is that if I'm very good in math, you're very good in languages, well, we can come together and actually do better than individuals alone. So that produces more economic value. That produces bigger companies, more revenues, maybe new markets, uh, more dollars or won in our pockets, right, as entrepreneurs, that really does good things. So it's focusing when you need to focus on the right thing. The other thing is, and this is similar to the school analogy and more from a, a management or investment perspective, is you think about when you need to focus on what's important. So how do you identify those priorities? This is what venture capitalists and private equity companies do. Venture capitalists look at, there's 10 companies in clean energy. For example, the China Clean Energy 4 or 5 fund. That's four and a half, five billion dollars. Um, looking at a whole portfolio of companies that are doing solar, clean tech, um, low greenhouse gas emissions, um, energy production. But which companies 
are going to be the next Baidu? Which companies are going to be the next winners? Well, we don't know. So what do we do? We invest a little bit in a lot of companies. So this is where we hedge our bets. This is where we take risks. So how are investors, how are venture capitalists, how are us as individuals, entrepreneurs, executives rewarded? Well, we know that maybe just one or two out of 10 investments are going to produce a lot of money and the rest are going to lose all our money. So without risk, there are no big rewards. This is a truism in economics and management throughout the world. This is very sad to say. In the United States, China, and most countries around the world, teachers, professors, secretaries, assistants, office employees are not paid very well. Who, who's paid very well? Entrepreneurs. What's the difference? They take a lot of risks. Teachers, professors, office workers take a salary. A stable. Stable. They don't take a lot of risks. Okay. Right? Even though without education, you have no foundation in, in your economy. And you have no ability to be productive, to create new technology, etc. So this is something we need to think about as a society, not just as Americans, not just as Chinese, but as human beings. What is providing tremendous value in our economy, even though they're not taking risks in terms of financial risks or risking their lives, they're providing tremendous value, but they are not remunerated, they're not paid in that way. So um, you think about what risks we take. I don't like to gamble. I love going to Las Vegas and Macau would be wonderful to see shows, etc. but I would never gamble. Why would I never gamble? And I, I have lots of friends, Chinese, American, etc. Come on and Mark, let's go, let's go gamble. <laughs> Why don't I gamble? Is because I know the risks there. And I know the risks are against me. In blackjack, you have 47% odds. So I'm going to lose each and every time, and the casino is going to win. That's why they invite me, pay for dinner, <laughs> come stay, etc. Right? But it's an explicit business relationship, and I have a good time, and the casino makes money, and we smile, and, and that's fine. Um, where I will take risks, though, are in areas where, as an individual, as an executive, I can shape. I can change those odds in my favor. So instead of 47%, maybe it's 60%, 70%, 80%. So the closer I can get it up there, the more money, time, energy, effort I can invest to create a bigger return. Interesting, Dr. Ma. Uh, thank you. Uh, just two points really quick that I think are so important. One is when I talk to executives, when I talk to um, national decision makers, they have two jobs mm -hmm. they need to do, whether in, in China, the US, whether in Beverly Hills or Beijing. The first job is to set a vision for the organization. It's the destination where we need to go. The second job, and arguably much more difficult, is working with the team, working with individuals, working with their people, is to give those team, that team, those people, those individuals, the time, the space, and the resources for them not only to do their jobs, but to be the best they can be. That is critical. That's the difference between good to great. That's the difference between succeeding and failing. And that's something that I've seen time and time again all throughout the world. So when, when you think about entrepreneurs, when you think about successful leaders or, or business people, there are political leaders, Deng Xiaoping, Martin Luther King. Um, they put together great ideas with great teams and created wonderful things. Think about it in, in, in the business world. There's Warren Buffett. There's Michael Bloomberg. There's Robin Lee of Baidu. They surround themselves with good people, wonderful teams, and create fantastic economic value that us as individuals, business people, as citizens, we can aspire to. So they are true heroes that we should look to. In your new book, The Performance of Nations, what information are you hoping to give to your readers and who do you hope will read your book? Why? In our book, we're answering two fundamental questions. 
first is, what is the economic cost of politics? And the second is, what's the political cost of economic growth? Who we went to read this book, the book is, is written, it's not an economics or mathematics textbook. It's written for individuals, you, me. It's written for executives, busy executives who don't have time to, to read. It's written for national decision makers who are very busy and have to do other things. And it's written for them so that we can understand the interplay between politics and economics and how we reach the shared prosperity that we're talking about. So the first question, what is the economic cost of politics? Easiest way to think about it is how much are we taxed in a given society for our level of development and the social services, the public goods provided by a uh, specific country. So the way to think about this as an American, right, I'll, I'll look at uh, the French. Love France, have uh, lots of relatives there, but most Americans would say, uh, the France, the, uh, France has a very high tax rate. So direct and indirect taxes in terms of income tax plus value added tax and service tax, et cetera, add up on average maybe 55, 60%. That's a lot of money. So for every dollar or one, uh, every one that comes in my pocket, 55 to 60 of those cents goes to the government. Well, that's a terrible thing. How am I supposed to go out and, and make money? Well, you have to ask yourself the question, what do you get in return from the French government? I get six weeks of vacation every year. Here in this country, you only get two. Um, I get a wonderful retirement and pension system, besides enjoying Paris, the Champs-Élysées, French wine, etc. So it's an explicit trade-off that we're making. Come to the United States. Marginal tax rates, 28 to 35% of every dollar that I make, 28 to 35% goes to the government. But there's a lot of indirect taxes. So we have sales tax here in California. We have a, a car tax. We call it registration, right, um, that you don't have in other um, states. But we have wonderful infrastructure here in, in California. So the effective tax or the total tax rate is more like 45%. Not 55 like France, only 45. But I also have wonderful economic opportunities here. So I have the potential to start a company, to grow, to get private equity or venture capital. Um, but I don't have six weeks vacation, and I don't have retirement. I have to save for my own retirement. Let's go to China. China, the uh, effective tax rate is about 25%. So much lower than France, much lower than the United States. You might not have six weeks vacation like the Greeks, but you don't have the same financial problems as the Greeks because you're growing at eight plus percent and you should be growing at, at that rate for quite some time. So that provides individuals with a very different economic opportunity for them. So we ask the question, politics is not good, it's not bad, that's my opinion, that's your opinion. What we want is an objective measure of you get what you pay for. And that's why we look at it from a taxation perspective in terms of the goods and services and the economic opportunities uh, we get. So what we can do is actually compare the performance of nations. We compare different countries with different political systems over different times to see how much you pay for what kind of goods, what kind of economic opportunity, and what kind of life you can actually have. That's the first part of it. That's what's powerful. Dr. Mark, your book, The Performance Relations to the General Public, sounds very difficult. But when you, after listen to your explanation to your book, sounds like the uh, good tax policy is making the country the good performance. That's absolutely correct. Absolutely correct, and it's not as difficult as, as you think. The second question we answer in the, in the performance of nations is, what is the political cost of economic growth? Mm -hmm. So it's the opposite question. And here the mathematics and the economics is very complex, but the concept is very simple. Think about an investor. 
uh, an investor is going to put money in the market and they might invest in stocks, they might invest in bonds, they might invest in gold, real estate, currencies, etc. Um, so during the 2008 global financial crisis, I had to take a lot of money out of stocks. Why? The banks weren't doing very well here and a lot of people put money in gold, right? Real estate came down, so we took money out of real estate, reallocated it into gold or currencies, etc. That's called rebalancing, and in finance theory, it's portfolio optimization. That's the technical finance and economics term. But every single investor, individual investors, you don't have to be a Hong Kong or a London financier, understands to do that, right? So, we believe that just like the investor, the government is making an investment in a country. Well, how do they make an investment in a country? What's the, what's the ec uh, political cost of economic growth? It's their national budget. It's how much money they spend on education. How much money do they spend on infrastructure? How much money they spend on financial services? How much money they spend on general services, defense, etc. So, think about, okay, well, we're going to spend different amounts, we're going to have different budgets, but what does that do? That produces economic growth. That produces opportunity. That's the brilliance of it. It's looking at the government, looking at the political system as an investor, trying to balance its portfolio to maximize a return called economic growth. So we know that when we spend money on defense, I'll create big jobs and airplanes and, and lots of things. So that creates a, a, a nice bump and, and some growth in the economy. Unfortunately, or, or fortunately, these things don't get used. So <laughs> over time, they're sitting there, and it takes more money to maintain them, and growth dips down, and then these assets depreciate. Well, conversely, education. I spend money on education, but uh, it takes two or three years for you to get a degree. You have to go to college, university for four years. Uh, you go to graduate school another two to four years. So you don't start producing economic value or output until later on. So in the beginning, when I spend more money on education, it's a cost. Later on, over time, it's a revenue. It's a gain. So you have these costs and gains, but you also have the balance of the portfolio. So what we found is that spending on social welfare, on defense, on infrastructure, at particular times of development. For example, there's a, there's a best way for the Chinese to spend, which isn't the same way for the US to spend, because we're at different stages, different levels of development. Once the Chinese get to close to economic parity with the United States, their budgets, the, the politics is going to look very, very similar to the United States. That's what we can see. That's what we can show. So, we ha now have an objective measure of what's the best way to optimize our economic growth, and we can see then the effect politics has on that in terms of what are our national budgets, what are our public sector expenditures. Why is this important, looking at the, the, the economic costs of politics and the costs of economic growth? Because it gives us a dialogue, it gives us a narrative for individuals as citizens for executives, for business people, for politicians, to have a debate, to have a, a dialogue in not a partisan way, not that I'm pro and you're anti, not that I, I believe this is right or wrong, but in a, in a very neutral way, in an objective way, to figure out how we can grow together, how we can do things together and how we can achieve this shared prosperity. So that's the real hope for the book. Looking at these different political budgets, this is what explains why so many Americans, so many economists, and so many individuals were wrong about China's growth. They said that China could not grow, China could not be a developed nation until they did extensive political reforms. We show empirically through data was absolutely not the case. China could grow very easily given their budgets, given the, their political style. So you, you look at uh, Deng Xiaoping's reforms 1978 and opening up, 
They did not need to change the entire national budget. They did not need to change the entire system. All we needed to do was start with some small special economic zones, open it up to foreign direct investment, which created a wonderful multiplier effect. And we're seeing the results of that today. According to your background, I would call you an economic practitioner. According to your professional expertise, what do you think of the current of the world economic crisis? Can you advise us as to what can attitude we as a general public should have as we face economic crisis? Why? The attitude we have as individuals, as the general public, as executives, as business people, is the exact same. Um, every day I wake up in the morning, I ask myself one question. I ask myself, what can I do better today? to make a difference. Um, and so what does that mean? Well, how can I provide better products or services to my customers? How can I make my employees, my teams, uh, my partners happier so that they can provide greater economic value? How can I protect them, give them the time, space, and resources to do their job? How can I smile more at strangers on the street from a personal level? So that's how I start my day off, every day. Mm -hmm. And then every night before I go to sleep, I ask myself the question, what lessons did I learn today as a student of business or as a student of life? Was my time spent, was my investment in a product or in a partnership, was that worth it or not? Should I extend it? Should I take that money and put it somewhere else? Um, so. Did I create more value, more opportunity today than I did the day before? So those are the two fundamental questions I ask uh, each and every day. Having had, had the luxury of experience working with you know, institutions, organizations such as the World Bank and doing development throughout Africa um, and Asia, having worked with international management teams, Chinese teams, American teams, international teams, having created strategies for mergers, acquisitions, um, uh, company roll-ups, and creating jobs and economic value and, and a lot of money, uh, I come back to one thing and one fundamental lesson that I think all of us can learn. And, and it's, it's what I call, we create the world we live in each and every day. What does that mean? If we don't like something, it's up to us to change it. We can sit here and we can see the global financial crisis and I can look at all the negative media on it and I can look at uh, the declining US dollar, I can look at the poor economic performance numbers mm -hmm. for the US economy, I can take all my money and put all the cash in a, in a mattress and go hide. What does that do? Well, there's still people out there in the market making money. There, there's still opportunities to be had because there's still people going out and whether they're competing in the red ocean or blue ocean, even, even better, they're creating new markets, new opportunities. So I'm definitely not someone who likes to hide uh, in such times because those are the times where we have to be pushed. We have to be challenged. This is where we must innovate because we're in a different market, a different environment. So you might not have the same sort of spending habits. I, I might not be investing in real estate as heavily uh, as I would, but there are new investments. There's new areas. And so the challenge is for us to find those and to always be able to create these things. Because as I said, you could look at it from the glass half, and this glass is half empty or it's half full, right? And those who look at it as half empty, the, the glass will probably go down. Those who look at it half full and act on it in terms of a business or a financial or investment perspective, most likely will fill their cup up, even when it's a global crisis. That's the challenge. That's the opportunity at the same time. Shengzhou, let me give you an example um, of why I, I don't think, contrary to probably many economists here, um, as well as globally, that China's going to collapse and that collapse is going to be precipitous and the collapse is, is going to last a long time. First of all, we know from economics that the trend is only going up. 
So we know that maybe there's a drop, that drop might last a quarter, two quarters, three quarters, mm -hmm. but it's not going to drop from 9, 10% to negative 10%. We, we know that's not going to happen. Um, so that's from an economist perspective. Let me tell you just from a human or business person perspective. Last year, I had the opportunity to uh, work with a wonderful retail manufacturing and investment group in Beijing over several months. Uh, they have several retail stores in uh, northern China. And looking at the growth there, and it's fantastic, and it's the same thing walking into a mall in Los Angeles or New York or walking into Beijing, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. Same level of service, quality, experience, fantastic. Um, but where I was surprised, and this is where I'm very hopeful and optimistic, they were opening up stores in second and third tier cities, uh, Xi'an, Shenyang, etc. And seeing the economic growth there, seeing a mall in Shenyang or Xi'an reminded me as a kid growing up here in this country in the 70s, and I grew up in Ohio, it wasn't in New York or Los Angeles, uh, reminded me of the exact same thing. It took me back to 1975, 1978 in Ohio because you had people coming to the mall, buying goods and services and brands that before you never knew. When I grew up as a kid, there were two types of bicycles. One was Schwinn, which was what I had, and the other was Huffy. That was it. There was only two bicycle manufacturers. And a bike, I remember arguing with my dad or crying when I was a kid, I want a bike for Christmas or something like that. Well, today, you can buy a bicycle for $20 or $20,000 because the products become differentiated, because consumers have become sophisticated. You look at China and you look at consumer uh, spending patterns, the old Chinese mentality was going to a wholesale market, mm -hmm. right? But today, they're becoming very sophisticated. They know the difference between a cup that costs half a kwai and, a, mm -hmm. and, and the, the quality of a cup that costs 100 yuan. So the engine of economic growth in these second and third tier cities, I would love to see the numbers on it, but I am positive, because I've seen it with my eyes and I've smelled it with my nose, I'm sure it's 10, 12% compared to Beijing, Shanghai, et cetera, which is lower. So there is a lot of hope for expansion. And even though people talk about you know, potential crisis and reverberation from the European markets and, and the US markets to Shenzhen and uh, Hong Kong from a financial perspective or Guangdong from a manufacturing perspective, Chinese economy now is, a lot of it can be domestically driven. So you guys have gone through the transition of an export-oriented economy to having a, a wonderful domestic base that can actually drive your economy and help offset any potential risk of financial crisis. So that's one thing I, I think you know, a lot of people are, are bearish on China. I'm still very, very bullish in terms of what we can do. So. This, this gets back to what we were talking about earlier. You've talked, you've interviewed with hundreds of people all throughout the world. And I ask you, what do you think, uh, Zhu Zheng? Are people the same or are they different, in your opinion? Um, if they target some subject, they're often different. But if they're from people's um, you know, attitude, or where human being, of course, the same. The same, absolutely. And, and that's such an important point. So the reason why you and I are talking, the reason why Hu Jintao and Barack Obama, the reason why General Motors and Shanghai Automotive Investment Corporation are talking is because we understand the possibilities of what we can do together, of the great things we can do when we cooperate. So that's why I say a fundamental believer in, in politics, economics, business. We create the world we live in each and every day. If we don't do it, then the markets could go south, the markets could do well, but we have the potential, we have the opportunity, we have the responsibility to actually affect change. So I look forward to the world that you and I are going to create, that uh, our next presidents, are going to create and our next business leaders are going to create over the next 50 years together. 
And that's what we call shared leadership and shared prosperity. Dr. Mark, thank you. Come to my Jiu Jitsu. Thank you for watch my Jiu Jitsu. See you next time.